From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Author Interviews, conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. Hello, welcome to our JAMA Oto podcast series. I'm your web editor, Dr. Paul Bryson from Cleveland Clinic. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Drs. Jesper Schmidt and Manuela Cantuaria from the University of Southern Denmark. And today we're going to be discussing your recent publication on hearing loss, hearing aid use, and risk of dementia in older adults. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite, Paul. Before we get into the article, can you give the listeners, um, each of you, some of your background, just a brief little synopsis of your interest in this topic and just an overview of your work to date? I'm an ENT specialist from Denmark and uh, have been working a lot with hearing loss within audiology, but also within auto neurology, as I also do some vestibular stuff here in, uh, in Denmark. But uh, re- research-wise, I have been uh, very interested in hearing loss in, in various aspects. And then we have been doing this project on uh, hearing loss and dementia uh, together with our group here. And this is what we will talk about today. Yeah. So I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern Denmark, and I have a background in epidemiology. So when working with epidemiology, I'm interested in analyzing different diseases and different potential risk factors for those diseases and considering dementia one of the most important disease to be discussed nowadays. Investigating hearing loss as a potential risk factor is really exciting to me, and that's what makes me motivated on the topic. Well, I very much appreciated reading the article. There's a lot of public health interest in this topic as we look to understand aging. In some of the countries, we have over-the-counter hearing aids providing an opportunity for patients to possibly have easier access to hearing amplification and hearing health. You know, we had an earlier podcast looking um, at the -the over-the-counter use uh, from South Africa. But let's dive into the paper here. So if one of you would, just give the listener just a little, um, how did you approach the methods of assessing this? So in this paper, we follow the population-based approach meaning that we didn't recruit participants, but we analyzed data from all the residents living in a specific region, the region of southern Denmark. And the reason we focused on this region is because we have established a database there that combines data for all the hearing examinations that have been conducted in the public clinics in this entire region. So um, we used that database and we also made use of one of the biggest advantages of Denmark in terms of epidemiology, that is the existence of different registers that covers the entire country. So with these registers, we're able to retrieve data on socioeconomic status, demographics, uh, medical history, also address history, making sure that the person has lived in the specific region and so on. So by having the data, we thought we had a good start to actually do a nice cohort study. Thank you for that. So can you both speak a little bit more about the power of the registry? Is this a sort of an, a, one electronic health record where the audiologic data is able to be uploaded? I, I know here in the United States, we have a bit more heterogeneity in our health system, if you will. And and various electronic health records. And, um, you know, we certainly are trying to get better and better at sharing and, uh, and at uploading or being able to evaluate audiogram data. What were sort of the strengths and how did you approach this registry? Has it been around for a while? Yeah, in Denmark, it's, it's like when you look into audiology, you have a public system and a private system. And, and if you take the public system, it's, it covers, I would say, about 60% of the patients. And, and it means that they will go to a, a hospital-based hearing clinic where they will have the hearing test, the audiometry done. And in this region, as uh, Manuela explained, a uh, region of southern Denmark, uh, we have had the same system. We have stored all these tests since 1998. So this means that we have a, a quite long period where we actually have access to these hearing tests. But still, also in Denmark, there are some kind of, of heterogeneity also because some of the hearing tests out there are also 
at uh, some uh, private ENT uh, practitioners, and we haven't got access to this part of the test, but still a vast majority of all the patients that at least have been examined once in the public system, uh, we have got access to this data. So we did a lot of work on the data to actually uh, pre-process it so that we actually could use it for merging with the health registries where we have all the diagnoses. So that's from the national health registries that we got the information on uh, whether patients have got a dementia diagnosis, for instance. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about those endpoints? You know, like specifically, we could talk, you know, how many, approximately how many people have more than one audiogram, and I guess over sort of what time period. And then if you could just share with the listener a little bit about what are sort of the endpoints or outcomes for that dementia diagnosis and any other insights from how you defined your variables? Yeah, so in, in relation to the hearing database, we do have, I would say for, if I'm not wrong, for around 60%, we have more than one audiogram over time. But yeah, so we made use for those that had uh, more than one audiogram, we made use of the two of them. But for those that had only one examination, we just kept the person is still Uh, without being able to know any progression of the hearing loss. But yeah, in relation to dementia, we looked at all-cause dementia. So we are able in the registry, we are able to retrieve all dementia diagnosis and different subtypes of dementia as well, like Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Parkinson-related dementia, and so on. But because of the number of cases, we prefer to keep the analysis focused on all-cause dementia. So basically gathering all types of dementia combined in a single category. And then we also did a sub-analysis with looking only at Alzheimer's disease. I appreciate that. So, you know, when you did all that, so share a little bit about your results. What did you find? So we did find an increased risk of dementia if you have a hearing loss. So there's a 7% increased risk of dementia if you're diagnosed with a hearing loss. And if we're looking at at those with a more severe hearing loss, it's actually a 17% increased risk of dementia if you have a more severe hearing loss. And with a severe hearing loss, it's here defined as a pure tone average of more than 60 decibel. And then we also looked at a subgroup of our data set where we actually have some information on whether the patients have got hearing aids and whether we have a clear indication of that these hearing aids were actually used. In this subgroup, we found that it was still 6% that had an increased risk of dementia if you have a hearing loss and are treated with hearing aids. But if you are not using your hearing aids, then you will have a 20% increased risk of dementia if you are diagnosed with a hearing loss. So this is some indication of that, yes, there's an association between having a hearing loss and the risk of getting dementia. But at the same time, it also says that there is a possibility that you actually can reduce that risk if you are using hearing aids to treat that hearing loss. Yeah, it's so interesting because I imagine you're catching people at various time points in sort of their hearing and cognitive health journey, right? I'm guessing it's probably unknown how long the hearing loss has been present. I don't know if the database provides clarity of that or how long the diagnosis of all-cause dementia existed prior to the hearing amplification or hearing aid use. Um, Is there any insights from the database or is that is it difficult to capture where they're at in that journey of diagnosis, intervention, surveillance? Yeah, that's a very good question. I would say one of the advantages we have is by looking at the longitudinal data and following people over time is that we can know when the person got a hearing loss diagnosis at least and a diagnosis for dementia afterwards. So we can make sure that the hearing loss has anticipated the diagnosis of dementia. But you are completely right that in relation to the intervention and when the person started using hearing aids, this is a bit unclear from the data that we have. And this is because the databases on hearing aids subsidize 
that Jesper has mentioned before, they are more recent in terms of time. So we cannot be completely sure if the person is a recent user or if a person if the person has used hearing aids for a longer period of time. But this is one of the limitations of the study as well, that there will be a hearing loss misclassification because there are some people that would simply have a mild hearing loss and will not be diagnosed. It seems like such a good opportunity, though, for public health and cognitive health, you know, as we all hopefully age. And, you know, it it seems like you could make the argument that hearing health becomes part of the, you know, your checklist when you get a physical as you move from perhaps even starting in middle age into older adulthood. It seems like not a heavy lift to get a hearing assessment on people as they age. I think it's very important, actually, because we do see also within just uh, hearing loss or audiology in general, there is some kind of uh, a skepticism uh, among uh, among patients. So they probably have uh, symptoms of a hearing loss for quite some time before they actually show up in the clinic and have their hearing examined. And uh, we know from other studies that there could easily be several years where you actually have a, a suspected hearing loss but are not getting uh, treated for that. And also if it comes out to... For instance, a cognitive decline and later on dementia, it is probably the same thing here that you also, for a certain time period, probably have some barely visible symptoms. And it's only when you are getting at a later state in the progression of the condition that it is probably noticed by some of your relatives that there's something going on here. So we actually think that for both conditions, hearing loss and dementia, there may be some time point where where people actually, where patients actually have symptoms quite some time before they actually get the diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, it seems, you know, easy enough to assess, you know, people get their cholesterol checked, people get their blood pressure checked. These are all things that are part of the routine in the office. It seems like hearing health and hearing status has a seat at that table, probably. Yes. Exactly. And I think this is one of our main goals is to make people more aware of the importance to check because, yeah, it could avoid some cognitive decline in the future. Well, I I appreciate you sharing these results with us. I'm sure our readership is going to be interested to see this in print. Any other take-home points or future directions that the listener should be aware of or looking for? Yeah, I think it's important to mention here also that, as Jesper mentioned, we did find the associations between hearing loss and dementia. But if if we compared with some previous studies, some of the studies that are most cited, the magnitude of these associations are considerably weaker compared to the previous studies. So I think it's important to mention here that there's still a need for other studies using longitudinal data and using larger sample sizes, because there are not so many on the topic, to confirm the findings. And actually, I think it's important, the more studies, the better for us to determine the the clinical relevance of the findings. And another thing to add here is also in Denmark, we have a public funded healthcare system. So this means that that every patient basically could have a free access to get a hearing aid if they get them through the public systems. And we also know that Denmark has a high coverage of hearing aids per capita. So that's maybe one thing to consider here, that uh, even though that we are finding this association in a Danish population, it may be that you can also find it in other populations and It may explain why they find it with the higher risk rates in other populations, because there may be also be some people with more mild hearing loss that are treated here. And it could be that in other countries, they may have postponed the decision of treating with uh, getting a hearing aid. It's because they are expensive and they don't think that they have a high need at the moment. But then later on, when the need is higher, then they're probably getting the hearing aid. So this could be a uh, an explanation that there are some societal differences here compared to other countries. And I think that's important to be aware of also. Well, I appreciate having you both on the podcast and I congratulate your work and I look for more contributions from your team in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, thank you for listening. I'm Paul Bryson, your web editor, and I've been speaking with Drs. Jesper Schmidt and Dr. Manuela Cantuaria from the University of Southern Denmark. 
about hearing loss, hearing aid use, and the risk of dementia in older adults. You can find a link to the paper in this episode's description. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com or search for JAMA Network wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. Thanks for listening.